Okay guys, so Microsoft has their own classification for a risky user or a risk detection based off of the trillions of sign-in logs that they're getting every day. And this risk detection is actually a leading indicator for user account compromise. By default, as an MSP, you're not gonna get alerts based off of a new risk detection or a new risky user. And I actually just talked to an MSP last week who had a user account compromised due to token theft, which we're seeing a lot of. And this actually led into a fraudulent wire being sent for over $500,000. So in this episode, I wanna walk you through understanding how Microsoft classify risk and risk detections within 365. I'm gonna show you how to set up alerts to go to your PSA or ticketing system. And then number three, I'm gonna show you my top policy that you can put into place to help actually prevent the leading attacks for user compromise today. Hey guys, before we dive in, just a quick introduction. My name's Nick, I'm a Microsoft MVP, and I create content here for MSPs around Microsoft 365. Let's go ahead and dive in now with understanding how Microsoft classifies risky users and risky sign-ins. Okay guys, so first we wanna understand how Microsoft classifies users as risky or has risk detections in general that'll populate in the Entra Admin Center. So if you think about this at the very top level, they're getting trillions of signals every day from the variety of Microsoft 365 companies and downstream users that are signing in to collect an aggregate level of data that they can use to detect things like malicious IPs or locations as an example. They can detect leak credentials from users on the dark web and they can detect certain malicious patterns in sign in such as an adversary in the middle page where somebody's using a reverse proxy to be able to sign in and detecting that and saying that that's a risk detection that classifies the user as x risk level now at the company layer there's also a lot of activity going on here from all the users signing in and Microsoft's using machine learning model to create a baseline to say that we know that your users sign in from this location or IP most frequently. And even at a user layer, if you have you know, a remote workforce or people are signing in all over the country, as an example, it'll still gather a baseline about that singular user to understand that, hey, you know, Nick is signing in from Denver, Colorado, 99% of the time he signs in on this device and he uses this browser. That way they can detect anomalies in that sign in activity to determine if that's potentially risky or not. Now, when we talk about that, Microsoft's gonna classify a sign in as risky or user as risky, and they're gonna give it the severity of low, medium, or high. Now, they're gonna do that based off a variety of factors, one of which is just the likelihood that that sign in is actually malicious or suspicious in nature, depending on how far it deviates from the baseline, as in what percentage uh, is the confidence level, right, of that machine learning algorithm gonna say, hey, this sign in does not look familiar, we're gonna alert on that. And the second factor is dependent on the type of detection. And what I mean by that as a more direct example, let's say we take Cloud Capsule as an example of a company and all of our users are genuinely speaking signing in from Denver, Colorado. And in one case we have a user, maybe it's me, signing in from Boise, Idaho eight hours after I signed in from Denver, Colorado. Now, Microsoft might come in and classify this as a low risk because of the fact that yes, it is different and not familiar with my typical sign-in of Denver, Colorado, but it's eight hours and it's still in the United States and so on and so forth, as far as our other factors that they might be looking at, and that they may classify as low to none as far as the risk state goes. Now, on a different example here, if you take that same user and you said, hey, they signed in from Denver, Colorado, and there's a one hour difference, and then they signed in from Tokyo, Japan, that would actually be classified as impossible travel, and they likely mark that user as high risk. Now, this location difference is just for clarity and just for the sake of an example. There's a lot of other examples here, like leak credentials, as an example, would immediately classify as high risk in most cases, and the same thing with a variety of different other indicators as far as the detection types. So it's all dependent on what the sign-in properties actually look like, and then obviously again, what's the deviation from the baseline for that user and for the company as a whole. So if we go back to my earlier example where I cited that an MSP told me they had a client that wired $500,000 to a fraudulent bank account, we walk through that attack. This is a phishing email that went through 
and was sent to the CEO of the company. That CEO clicked on a link, which brought them to a legitimate looking Microsoft page. This is adversary in the middle attack that's very common prevalent in our space today. With that page, the user is in this case, the CEO entered their credentials, they fulfilled MFA, and they were redirected to the Microsoft page. But behind the scenes here, their token was actually harvested, where the attacker here was able to replay that and a compromise their account, i.e. they didn't have to even log in, they just replayed that session token, and they were able to get into their account. And from there, the attacker registered a secondary MFA factor so they could have persistence and maintain access into this account. They registered this third party application, which is called EM Client, which allowed them to download the entire user's mailbox locally. And from that, they were able to find the controller within the organization and they were able to send them an email to trick them to updating wire information to send money to that fraudulent bank account. Now I walked through that really fast here and that was just one example, but we're seeing in these attacks, business email compromise on a greater scale. And the key thing here to highlight is all the way back here at this part of the attack chain when the user actually was redirected and they signed into this fake looking Microsoft page, that's actually when most likely you would have had the alert created here for a risky user. This infrastructure here to stand up this page in this example is going to be using a different location and IP address than the user is currently at today, if that makes sense. So instead of signing in from Denver, Colorado, this could have been, again, a foreign country. It could have also been something where they were signing in from a different state and IP address altogether, but their sign-in logs could have been so close that it would have detected it as a higher risk. But generally speaking, this is going to create, at bare minimum, a low-level risk alert in the Entra Admin Center. So I want to show you guys how to set up the alerts to go to your PSA or ticketing system because a lot of people don't know. Even with a business premium license, you get risk detections available. You need a P2 license, which I'll get into to get into risky users and some more protections. But at bare minimum, you are getting these types of alerts here created for suspicious logins. And so it's very important to understand that within the Entry Admin Center, if you go under protection and then risky activities, you have this risk detections frame here. And I pulled up a couple different examples here as well, where we have, in this case, unfamiliar properties um, for a user here where they signed in from Austin, Texas. And this is again, where it's been doing some machine learning and found that there was a lot of differences between the IP and location of this user where normally, again, I'm signing in from Denver, Colorado, and this infrastructure here that I signed into, or the location in this case was Austin, Texas. So they reported this as a medium level risk um, based off of that, and we dismissed this, but this is giving me you know, some correlation to say, hey, this is not familiar. Maybe they just signed in from Colorado a little bit uh, before this, and this is where you can go in and you know look at the user sign-ins and things like that to understand the pattern, right? Are they on vacation? Should this be dismissed? Is it a false positive? Or in this case, if you look at this one, this is a really big one because this one is where he's actually signing in from a completely different country. Um, and the risk level in this case, again, was high. And we're also using the detection type of an anonymous IP address. Now I'll link in my blog post that'll supplement this with the various types of detections Microsoft's looking for and what licensing model that they're looking for them just so you can have that. But I wanted to show you this just because it's important that you understand where this is located before we end up going and looking at how to set up alerts. But on the alert front, you need to go into the security admin center for a tenant. So in this case, I'm just going to log in here. You'll need to be an admin to set this up. But if you're an MSP and setting this up for your clients, you should have a direct connection here with incidents and alerts that would be coming from the Entra admin center here for things like risky users. And in the settings portion here, what you're going to want to do is go under the Defender XDR section. And you're going to want to go under email notifications and you're going to add a notification rule. And you could call it whatever you like here. You could call it PSA connection, anything like that. 
and you want to bare minimum select these two boxes here as an MSP, which will give you the organization name and the email and include a tenant specific portal link. This makes it easier for your technicians or SOC analysts that are going in and looking at these things, but also you could create some cool workflow automations if you're a little bit more advanced in your PSA tool. So one of the things you know that you'd want to check here, likely you know if it's best practice, you check all of these, um, but you're only going to have access to obviously certain detections depending on the licensing here. Bare minimum, if you're on business premium, you would do things like Defender for Office 365. Um, identity protection, and even some of the Defender for Endpoint ones because it'll capture Defender for Business as an example of that. And then the alert severity here, obviously if you go all the way down to informational, it'll be pretty noisy. So you do have to be careful with that. But within here, you may wanna start as low, medium, high as an example, or start with all, and then determine if you can create some automation around the informational ones. And when you do this, um, you know, you'll be able to differentiate sources and create different um, alert severities too. So you may want to say, hey, I want to get everything for identity protection, but I only want to get low, medium, high for Defender for Office 365, right, as an example. I would do everything by default, um, you know, just, just starting out and then reduce the noise over time. The recipient email address, again, you know, this is going to be your support at most likely. Um, that'll create the email connector with your PSA tool and then you could set this up to save it and that will actually generate those alerts that you can use to investigate as part of a triage process now some of you out there might be thinking well nick if microsoft detects a high risk user what automated actions are they taking and the answer to that is actually nothing in most cases so this is where it comes down to this problem statement that i have here where if you go in and you say hey normally what what actions are you taking when you detect this you want to perform some type of investigation, but first and foremost, you want to kind of lock things down to stop any potential aggregate breaches from happening or, you know, basically stop the attack kill chain. And you'll do that with a couple of actions like blocking the user sign in, resetting their password, and then performing some type of investigation to see, you know, did any of these other things occur? Like the account being replayed into another device, new MFA registration method, a new application being registered, inbox rules being created, right? The typical incident response that we would normally be doing as part of a compromise. But in this case, we have what I've termed the Microsoft paywall problem or MPP. If you needed a new acronym in your life, which you not clearly did not, I'm giving you one here. But this is where we have a lot of frustration today in SMB where some of these additional features that you get for automated response as well as some of the advanced telemetry even for the sign-in detection types is going to be gated by an Entropy 2 license or an E5 license if you want things like the automated attack disruption feature, which would actually go ahead and prevent or block user sign in potentially automatically with what Microsoft detects. So this actually presents a problem for us in the sense of MSPs because we have this use case where we can't necessarily scale effectively if we think even about detecting all of these alerts that are coming in from the variety of companies that we manage, because in a lot of cases, they may be false positives. Users going on vacation or something detected as low risk that you investigate and a SOC analyst spends a half hour to an hour looking into it only to find that there's nothing actually wrong. And to be fair, that's the best practice that you should be taking, but it doesn't allow us to scale very much beyond a linear model where we need to have more technicians or SOC analysts looking at these things in order to go up. And the big thing that this does over time is it increases the risk to you as the MSP, but more specifically to the client, because every time you have to go in and manually start to investigate, you're running behind the clock, if you will. So if we talk about this user being breached here and you get alerted on it, ideally you'd be able to come in and mitigate things before they've registered a second method and you know done all these things to lead to the wire transfer, right? You've ideally removed the attacker, reset the password, rotated credentials, rotated the session, things like that before this actually turns into this use case where we wired $500,000 to a fraudulent bank but that's not exactly feasible, which is why many people in the space will turn to tools that manage this on their behalf or create an automated solution in lieu of Microsoft's licensing model. Common examples here would be Huntress, Blackpoint Cyber, 
as well as SAS alerts. Now, the final thing that I promised you in today's video was talking about a policy that I'd recommend to actually prevent account breaches or have the highest propensity of stopping a lot of the attacks that we see today. And it's really thinking about this quote unquote perfect world scenario, right? Of, hey, in this attack chain, if I could say that instead of responding to when this happens and when the user gets compromised and they have their token um, stolen and replayed from token theft in general, and there's a post breach incident that you're responding to, what if at this point in time, you could actually prevent this from happening altogether? Now, this is a very specific use case. There's obviously hundreds of different attack methods and types that you would want to cover for, but this is one method where, again, I'm always going to preach posture management over reactive nature of post breach incident. And this is a policy that you can put into place to actually start to break down these types of attacks and commonly why you'd be responding to risky users in general. So within the Entry Admin Center, if you go under conditional access and you create policies here, generally speaking, conditional access policies are going to be your number one solution for a lot of the various attack types you see, obviously focusing in here on the identity layer where we're seeing a lot of the attacks shift from, from the network layer or the device layer like we had in previous times. The one policy that I'm going to walk through today that I've already set up here is requiring a managed device. This is basically, we go back to our kill chain here and this particular attack that happened, if we require a managed device, this would actually prevent the man in the middle page flow from actually happening. That user would be prevented from signing in there and the attacker in this case wouldn't be able to harvest a token. Subsequently, after the fact, even after that, if that was to occur, they would also be prevented from doing things like going in and signing in after the fact, even if they've set up a secondary MFA method to maintain persistence. If they tried to log into a device that's not managed, then it would actually prevent that sign in and they wouldn't be able to log into the account. So again, this is stopping the kill chain at the earliest part here. And this is pre-breach, which is the key here versus post-breach mitigation, which is always what I'm gonna focus on. And in this case, you'd wanna at least first test this out, but normally you would go in and assign this to all users. You would assign this to all resources. And under the conditions here, depending on your environment, you would wanna set this up in a couple different ways. One of which is that you grant access, but you require the device to be hybrid joint. And this is if you're running a hybrid environment with local Active Directory in place. The other way that I have it today is if you're running more of a modern approach where all the devices are cloud only, you would include the device platform of Windows as an example here, and you would exclude and filter by trust type in this case, which is just the registration type, which says that it's ultra joint or ultra registered. You could just do ultra joined as an example of this. It depends on where you're at in your environment. And then in the grant controls, you would say, I want to block access. So this is again, a policy that I think is really achievable for a lot of us because we're using managed devices and most of the clients that we manage. And it actually stops this kill chain here. And a lot of the things that we see from a risk perspective, from the proliferation of attacks that are just in market at this point in time. Okay guys, that's everything I had for you today. Definitely comment below with any questions you had about this video and definitely subscribe to the channel if you wanna get more of these helpful tips on getting started with Microsoft Security Solutions. I'll see you guys next week.